Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for this uh, generous opportunity. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, engaging multi-stakeholder uh, in land use decision in Indonesia. Uh, before I start, I'm going to talk about a brief description of what I'm going to, uh, what is the background of the research, the method, uh, the result, and uh, implication of this uh, study. So before I start, I would like to know uh, the reactions of what uh, do you, what, how can you react with these uh, words? Futures, masa depan. Can I have one or two reactions? <laughs> Can I hurt uh, unpredictable? Yeah? Yeah. We, of, we, we often uh, ask about the futures. We uh, are very curious about the futures because we don't know uh, about the futures. It is unpredictable. It is, uh, there is a sense of uncertainty in the futures. Today, we also often ask about uh, the futures. What is the future of the forest? What is the future of the agriculture? What is the future of uh, rural and world poverty? What is the future of food and nutrition security? What is the future of uh, our resources? So these intriguing questions are keep uh, coming to us, and then it also attract uh, many researchers, innovators, and also policymakers to answer these questions, uh, to ask for solutions, how to thinking the futures, and also to uh, minimize uh, the impact, uh, minimize the uh, insecurity, uncertainty, and prepare for what might happen. So the bottom line is, uh, can we shape the futures, and if we can, how? So our foresight is based on uh, our approach uh, in this study, based on foresight approach. Uh, for you, if you are not familiar with uh, foresight, it's a systematic, participatory, and multidisciplinary approach to explore uh, mid to long-term futures and uh, driver of change. Uh, this is uh, the tools of foresight are uh, very. Uh, you can use uh, future studies, you can use uh, scenario building, you can use uh, visionings, and many more. So the, our research is uh, part of the project uh, called Colupsia, Collaborative Land Use Planning for Sustainable Institutional Arrangements. This is a collaboration between C4 and CIRAT. Uh, and funded by uh, European Union. Uh, we use uh, tools named uh, participatory prospective analysis. These tools are developed by our colleagues in CIRAT. And we selected uh, two districts in Indonesia, uh, one in Kapuas Hulu district uh, in West Kalimantan and one in Central Maluku in Maluku province. Uh, these two sites are interesting because uh, these two sites has uh, rich biodiversity. There are two national parks uh, in Kapuas Hulu, uh, Betung Karihu National Park and Danau Sentarum National Park, and one national park in Central Maluku, uh, Manusela National Park. And uh, it becomes interesting because the local government has a problem uh, dealing with the uh, development in this area because uh, local government uh, try to invite uh, investments, especially land-based investment, mining, and also oil palm plantations to the districts. And this also uh, has a challenge uh, in terms of how the district can move forward with development, but at the same time, they also have to uh, preserve uh, forests and also maintain uh, the ecosystem uh, provisions. So this was... Uh, why the questions of the futures of uh, land use uh, came about in these uh, districts. In, in particular, I will uh, talk uh, to the end of this uh, talk that I will talk in for Kapuas Hulu district. So the process that uh, we did uh, in this uh, research that we identify a group of experts, uh, consists of policy makers, uh, private sectors, uh, community leaders, and also uh, farmers, fishermen, uh, local businessmen. They also, we facilitate them to engage in series of uh, workshops. 
series of uh, meetings that they discuss what is the futures of the land use in this area, what is the factors affecting uh, land use of uh, the area for period of uh, 20 years. The period of 20 years they decided because of uh, this is in accordance to the time that uh, typical uh, development planning uh, done in this area uh, with the districts. And it is also the, the discussion was interesting because uh, people from different background, uh, people from different uh, educations uh, sit together in a group so they discuss in the equal and uh, equal environment. So the, uh, after they uh, discuss these uh, key variables, they also analyze what are the uh, mutual influence of these variables to the uh, land use, the future of the land use in the districts. I'm not going to detail of the process of the analysis, but uh, I will say that there are several key variables coming up from this uh, discussions by, done by the stakeholders. There are several key variables uh, that, that is uh, government policy, use of technology, uh, participation, uh, education, and customary law and wisdom. So these are the key variables that according to the stakeholders are uh, very important and shaping the future of the land use uh, in the districts. To develop the scenario, uh, these key variables need to be needs to be defined and also to be combined and also eliminate the incompatible scenarios. So there are four scenarios that uh, coming up from these uh, discussions. So I can show you uh, this is the scenario of uh, the coming up from this uh, discussion. Actually, at the, at the beginning, the scenario was in narrative text. But then after uh, they finalize the scenario, we make them in pictures. So when we deal with these people who are not coming to the meetings, they can easily understand uh, what is the scenario and they can easily see these beautiful pictures and uh, what is the, what happens uh, in the future, what could happen in the future. So this four scenario describe uh, possible uh, futures that might happen. There are uh, three scenarios uh, describing the situations, environmental degradations, uh, community marginalizations, and uh, economic uh, stagnations. And one scenario describing that uh, people, uh, community, uh, uh, local governments, and private sectors can be working together, sit together, and they define and also forming the land use uh, plan uh, for the districts. So there are several implications that uh, coming up from for the, uh, this research. Uh, as you can see that uh, having this uh, different scenario, you can see that there are opening uh, diverse possibilities. So there are not only one possible futures that may, they might see uh, that could be happens in the futures, but there are also different uh, possible uh, futures. It is also creating a new, new, new uh, knowledge, uh, new insight for the decision makers that it could be other options that uh, can be done uh, in the districts. It was, it was also interesting that when the group uh, discussed uh, this uh, scenario, it was come a scenario that development without oil palm. But unfortunately, uh, because of the situation of the district that uh, the oil palm issue was very sensitive, the stakeholders uh, decided uh, not to present this uh, to the local government because of uh, if they present this, the local government might not accept uh, this uh, scenario. So this also uh, interesting uh, for us to see the process, uh, although it was also unfortunate that uh, this scenario might not appear in the final scenario. Uh, the second was uh, this can be a trigger for a change. Uh, this scenario uh, we discuss again with uh, communities who are not uh, attend the meetings. 
we have uh, two, another two workshops and uh, we ask them to select whether which scenarios are desirable and which one are not uh, desirable. So based on these desirable and undesirable scenarios, they make action plans how to uh, achieve the desirable scenario and how to avoid or minimize the impact of the undesirable scenarios. And this process, scenario building, can also be integrated in uh, decision making uh, process. Uh, there are, there are uh, <coughs> process in the district called Musren Bank, and this uh, tools can be also integrated into Musren Bank because uh, it has a uh, long-term perspective and also uh, participatory. Compared to standard or typical traditional uh, planning process, which is uh, more not integrative, uh, these foresight-based plannings are more systemic and uh, more integrative. Therefore, it needs to be different way of looking at how this planning approach. So as a closing, I would like to quote Malcolm X. Uh, he said that the futures belong to those who prepare it for today. Thank you. Is there any uh, comment, question? Oh, then. Uh, thank you, Bayou. It's a very interesting uh, presentation, especially the topic itself is about spatial planning. My question is about uh, what was your strategies uh, to engage with the local government you know, to transfer the knowledge that you find from your research on the spatial planning? You know, because uh, if you do research on spatial planning, of course you expect that local government will adopt the result and then uh, implement as their strategy. My second question is, you mentioned about the oil palm and uh, mining. So where is the locations, I mean, where is the positions of oil palm and mining in the spatial planning that uh, you studied in your area? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, the first question about uh, how to engage uh, local stakeholders in uh, spatial planning, actually, we done uh, several uh, different research in this project that uh, we also develop uh, spatial maps. We also develop these uh, multi-stakeholder engagements. Uh, we also, uh, based on this uh, result of this uh, study, we uh, communicate them to the local, uh, local parliaments. We also communicate them uh, with the local governments. Uh, and then uh, we show them how this uh, current uh, spatial plan has uh, drawback or has a uh, disadvantage of how to shape the area of production and to shape how the area of uh, conservation, for example. But again, uh, this is uh, begin, uh, came a challenge to our project as well that uh, the decision of the spatial plan is not only in the district level access, but it's also in the national levels. At that time, uh, the district uh, still uh, working on the how to uh, propose a revision of the spatial plan, and there are very long process uh, spatial plan, especially uh, the approval in the Ministry of Forestry. That's the for the first questions. Uh, the second question about the how uh, where the location of the oil pumps and uh, uh, mining in the area actually. It was already uh, decided actually in the uh, spatial plan of the district that uh, the area that uh, belongs to the oil palms and mining has already been decided. Actually, we then we find out that uh, the area that belongs to uh, oil palm or the mining was supposed to be the uh, protection uh, area because it was located in the upstream area it was uh, located uh, inside the forest. So with this fact, actually, we also informed the government uh, and also local parliament that uh, this is not the right uh, things to do uh, of the investment in this uh, particular area. But then again, there is a political decisions uh, beyond this. And uh, that's also a challenge for us to, to comprehend here. Any other question, comment? Oh, 
if not, I have one. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very interesting. I'm just wondering, in your, in your looking into the future and in, t in your spatial planning, did you at all consider the, uh, any demographic change that's uh, uh, apt to happen? More people, fewer people, lots of people migrating either into Malaysia or into, the, into Pontiana, going mm. into cities, or just a, 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 a significant change. Because we know that there's a good deal of migration that happens uh, in this, uh, especially in this border area. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Uh, actually, we used the basic <coughs> facts of demographic area that the density of population in Kapasulu is like seven people per kilometer square. It is uh, very, very low uh, ad, uh, density. Uh, but we use this uh, basic information as uh, to uh, as a baseline for our uh, using this uh, imagining uh, what could be happens in the future. Uh, so, so this we consider this information as well, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the other, yes, I have a question actually. Um, what is the appropriate balance uh, between the, uh, the, uh, the participis, participatory processes, the voice of uh, grassroots people, and the voice of stakeholders, the interest of them, and also the uh, the expert judgment, the biophysical judgment that this area must be conserved when the same time that people want to, for instance, convert into the oil palm because oil palm is a lucrative business. How the, the, the right appropriate balance between the, the participatory processes and the uh, scientific judgment? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mary. That's uh, quite a difficult question, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think talking about the uh, balance of this, uh, how this uh, between participatory and uh, scientific judgment, actually, uh, in, at the local level, actually, we, we saw that uh, these uh, people who've been work, uh, living that area or enjoying development in area, they, sometimes they even feel that uh, they are, their voice is not represented. So that's, that's also the value of uh, using this participatory method that this can be, uh, the voice of these people are, can be included in this uh, process. But also, we cannot also forget there is also uh, other knowledge that we need to consider that, uh, that is coming from the scientific uh, people that, uh, this should be uh, in, engaged or should, this should be protected. So that's why I think at the end it comes to the decision of the policy makers how to, to balance or to balance this uh, participatory and, and uh, scientific decisions. Okay. Yeah. I want to invite actually uh, Yves Lamounier, as, uh, as I think is, is the, the boss of this kind of work. Yeah. So Pae. Any comment? Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> but uh, I think yeah, we have been involved with this uh, participatory prospective analysis with Bayou for a long time. Before Columbia Project, already in uh, Maluku, Bayou was doing that in Tanimbar Island. And uh, Nining is not here today, but she is quite uh, involved in this process for CERAM. I have been uh, quite uh, amazed to see how. how uh, uh, useful this tool is in terms of engagement with the stakeholders and uh, I think you should really uh, make uh, the difference between regarding to what you said before between uh, what is doing by you which is more uh, facilitating a process so all stakeholders are the people who are really uh, looking or uh, classifying the most important variable for them it's not us who are forcing uh, a process of scenario um, and in parallel, we have this uh, feeding of uh, better detailed data to, uh, to aliment this uh, workshop, for instance. So it's two parallel process between the biophysical aspect, of, for instance, or the social studies that we have in parallel and this uh, kind of uh, analysis made by the stakeholders themselves. And by who is fa facilitating this process. And when he requests more data, when they request more uh, information, we will feed them for the discussion. And uh, I find this tool very, very uh, useful. It has been very successful 
maybe more successful in CERAM, in the uh, people who are uh, asking about this um, implementation, where in CERAM we have the local government deciding to, to make a special group uh, after uh, mm -hmm. the life of Colupsia to continue to work on these aspects. In Capua Sulu, a bit more difficult, as uh, Bayou mentioned, because of this oil palm situation. But my question to Bayou now will be, uh, why not uh, trying again with the oil palm situation? Why, why, why do you think it was not possible to do that? Any other comment? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, so, out of scenario building, I guess an aim is to build consensus. And um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but the, did, were you including private industry as part of your um, stakeholder groups? Were, yeah. were they there for this process? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We also invited uh, them, uh, particular representative from oil palm plantations, to okay. attend uh, this uh, process as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you, Mas Bayub, yeah. <laughs> for the very nice presentations. I have one question, actually. It's like most of participatory activities, uh, it depends uh, highly to actually the facilitators to facilitate this yeah. uh, participatory approach. And you mentioned that uh, people but stakeholder comes and discuss equally in the processes is that come naturally or is something that uh, uh, that you need to work out as a facilitators mm -hmm. and that also lead to actually two questions not one <laughs> <laughs> and my other question is like uh, what 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 are your like the lesson learned from like facilitating this kind of participatory approach mm -hmm. thank you yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, at the beginning, uh, stakeholders were, uh, because they are coming from different backgrounds and they are not uh, familiar with each other, but uh, during the process, actually, we encourage uh, <coughs> those who are not uh, speak uh, much to, to speak, uh, and then we ask them uh, more uh, proportions to those who are not uh, speak to, to speak, uh, to, to be able to speak. And then uh, that's why uh, along the way uh, to this workshop from, because we held uh, four series of workshops in one week uh, per workshop. So then uh, these people become uh, natural uh, during the, the course of time, yeah, actually. So then I think the lesson learned from this uh, participatory process that uh, we need to facilitate the power imbalance at the beginning of the process because actually we always see there there is a power imbalance because they are member of the legislative, uh, there are uh, people from the government who has uh, different rank, a bit uh, local, just ordinary people, and even community leader is uh, maybe just they think that they only uh, powerless people in this uh, forum. So that's uh, we need uh, to balance the power relation first, and then we then we can come up with the uh, equal uh, environment and for discussions. Yeah. Okay, I want to say I want to invite a comment from Terry Sunderland actually because as, uh, to me there are some element of this work is really connected to the uh, landscape approach and he actually proposed ten principles of landscape approach how the what the bias was working connected to the ten principle of landscape approach. There's nothing like being put on the spot, is there? <laughs> okay. um, I think this uh, um, <coughs> overall framework <coughs> fits very well with the landscape approach, and I think that fundamentally, and we're going to be talking about this in the, in the next meeting actually, that um, this is the right way to go. It's a very good example. Steve, you want, uh, Pablo, please. Always I have been struggling when I see these exercises of participatory planning that they are done at the community level. So to what extent you deal with issues of scale of decision making? Because, it hap because one of your assumptions is that these actors that are negotiating in, in, mm. in this process, they can, take, uh, they can handle about the processes that will shape their future. Mm. So they have enough 
decision-making power about how to shape the future, but you have decisions taking place uh, at different levels that can, can be much more influential in shaping those, those futures. Mm -hmm. As for example, what you are saying, an oil pump company decides to come and uh, build, uh, or start to develop the, the land in that district, or you have a road that's been decided at the national level. So how you capture these decisions that are being made at different scales yeah. in order, in the process for these groups are thinking about, about the future. So how, yeah. how, is there a way to do that? Uh, yeah, I think wh what we did uh, during the process was to, uh, after this uh, scenario of analyze, actually we also uh, communicate uh, this scenario to a different level of decision makers. Actually, we have a, a meeting with the secretary of the districts. We also have a meeting with the legal, uh, local parliament. We also ha have another meeting with the uh, stakeholders in the provincial level. Even we also have a meeting at the national level inviting uh, Ministry of Forest uh, Tree representative and also different stakeholders in, in Jakarta at that time. So we, we, we communicate this uh, scenario throughout uh, this different level uh, in order to ensure that uh, whether this uh, scenario or the different features that might happen in Kapolsu can be also integrated into uh, planning uh, processes here. Yeah. Steve, you want to make a comment? Uh, actually, uh, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Bayou, for the great presentation, and I think it's been a good discussion. I think that we, you know, I, I'm still left with a question, maybe it relates to Pablo's, about uh, uh, agency uh, in these processes, uh, say, with the question of land rights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's valuable for local land users to have a sort of a structured process by which they can make input mm -hmm. into land use decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's often the case that they go into those discussions without bringing effective land rights with them, okay, that mm -hmm. the underlying ownership uh, in many settings uh, remains in the hands of the state. That hasn't always been the case, but it is in much of the country today so that they don't have that option to, in a sense, uh, withdraw their uh, agreement, mm -hmm. uh, to not uh, sanction, if you will, the decision on the basis of the control and authority that they have over those, those land use uh, mm -hmm. assets. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of stuck with kind of an outcome sometimes and maybe in many settings often mm -hmm. where these decisions are taken ultimately at a higher level by the authorities who have control over uh, rights to uh, uh, rights to those resources, mm -hmm. and so it remains a problematic uh, kind of uh, set of set of issues. And so it comes back to, for me, yes, these processes are very important. They contribute to, over the longer term, I think, a growing understanding throughout mm -hmm. the country on the uh, of the interests mm -hmm. of various stakeholders mm -hmm. and the need for them to be taken account of, uh, but. There needs to be these parallel efforts, I think, around questions of rights mm -hmm. and authority at various levels. And, it, mm -hmm. and that's where authentic negotiation mm -hmm. comes from. It's when mm -hmm. people bring rights and agency to the table. Mm -hmm. And that forces all parties to better account for the interests of others. And that's where I think true consensus can emerge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's just a great session. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.